Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the newly converted bear cultist Wilson Refined Grizzly with the cultist of the absolute background. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, don't forget to check out the channel's 5k subscriber giveaway, link in the description, so you can enter for your chance to win a completed Dina Soul Steeper deck and some nice unlockable upgrades for it before the deadline on July 31st. Additionally, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what the release schedule will look like for the upcoming weeks. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Wilson Refined Grizzly is a 2-2 bear warrior with Vigilance, Reach, Trample, and Ward 2 that costs 1 in a green, can't be countered, and lets us choose a background. Which in this case is Cultist of the Absolute, which costs a black and gives commander creatures we own plus 3 plus 3, Flying, Death Touch, Ward Pay 3 Life, and on our upkeep, sacks a creature. Taking a look at our commander first, Wilson is sporting a very low to the ground CMC, a typical stat block for the cost, uncounterability, and a staggering amount of keywords that can potentially make him into a powerful offensive and defensive threat if we can power up his humble stat block. Which is where Cultist of the Absolute comes in, providing our commander with a substantial stat boost, evasion, and even more protection. All for a single mana and sacrificing a creature on our upkeep. Which in our color combination is more of a bonus than a drawback, as our colors have plenty of ways to benefit from creatures dying. So, as we can see, Wilson alongside the Cultist of the Absolute background combined to give us a cheap and powerful commander with a built-in arsenal of keywords that other Voltron commanders can only dream of, with the caveat that we need other bodies on board to ensure that Wilson isn't quite literally consumed by his own power. Which is why this build will be taken in a token-focused direction, allowing Wilson's congregation to grow like any good cult and provide us with plenty of bodies to either power up with anthems alongside our commander to slam into our opponents, or instead be sacrificed for value or just to keep our commander's background online. Luckily for us, Golgari has no shortage of token creation to keep Wilson's flock growing, with green generating plenty of sources of woodland creatures of all shapes and sizes, and black giving us access to plenty of undead, rats, and the odd demon to keep our number of parishioners nice and high. And once our token cult members have flooded the board, we can use powerful anthems to stir them into an unholy frenzy to overwhelm our opponent's forces alongside our commander, or instead sacrifice them to Wilson's patron deity and reap the benefits of life gain and card advantage for doing so, which we can get even more value out of thanks to our death-focused payoffs. So let's get this sermon underway as the congregation is getting restless and want to hear their leader speak. And while said congregation is mostly comprised of woodland animals and zombies, it's still impressive considering that their cult leader's a bear. Let's just be thankful that Wilson's on our side, and not give too much thought on what dark deity Wilson struck a deal with to grant him access to powerful dark magic for himself and his cult for the occasional sacrifice of a squirrel. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, the first half brings us a pair of legendary token generators with Valentina Dean of the Vein and Avia Pashari Sage of Life Crafter. Valentine is an MDFC whose front face is a 1-1 with Menace and Lifelink that, whenever an opponent's non-token creature dies, exiles it and lets us pay 2 to create a 1-1 pest token that gains us 1 life when it dies, and whose back face is Lazette Dean of the Root, who's a 4-4 for 2 and double green that, whenever we gain life, lets us pay 1 to give all our creatures a plus 1 plus 1 counter as well as trample until the end of the turn. The Valentine side providing us with cheap graveyard hate and token creation to help build up our board, while the Lizette side lets us grow already established board states once our life gain sack outlets and death payoffs are online, making both sides great additions in both the early and late game. Ovia Pashari is a 1-2 that lets us either pay 2 a green and tapper to create a 1-1 servo token, or instead pay 4 a green and tapper to create an XX construct token where X is equal to the number of creatures we control, giving us access to create small tokens to go wide early as well as potentially huge tokens that take full advantage of our wide board states in the late game. Then the latter half of this slot brings us a pair of sack outlets in the form of Dockside Chef and Ravenous Squirrel, both of which let us sack a creature or artifact to draw a card, the former being a 1-2 that costs 1 and a black to do this, and the latter being a 1-1 that costs 1, a black, and a green to do this instead but also gains us a life, and, whenever we sack a creature or artifact, gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Both serving as cheap sack outlets that can repeatedly turn our tokens into draw in case we need card advantage over board presence, with the latter even growing into a potent threat as we do so. 
Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we have some additional token generators joining our ranks with Kazandu Tusk Collar, Piper of the Swarm, and Skurstag High Priest. Kazandu Tusk Collar is a 1-1 with level up for 1 in a green that, at level 2 through 5, we can tap to create a 3-3 elephant creature token and at level 6 plus creates 2 instead. Dropping early and providing us with a continual source of decent sized bodies provided we have the initial mana to pump it to at least level 2. Piper of the Swarm is a 1-3 that gives all rats we control menace, lets us pay 1 a black and tap it to create a 1-1 one, one rat, and also lets us pay 2 double black, tap it and sack 3 rats to gain control of target creature. Enabling us to create rat tokens relatively cheaply, granting those tokens evasion, and if those tokens reach critical mass, allowing us to turn them into a powerful theft effect to boot. Skurstag High Priest is a 1-2 that, if a creature died that turn, lets us tap it into other untapped creatures we control to create a 5-5 flying demon token, making use of our plethora of sack effects and big boards to reliably create big evasive demons turn after turn. Then we close out this slot with Sakura Tribe Elder, a 1-1 we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, serving as a decent source of land ramp to speed up our mana base while also proccing our death payoffs as it does so. Then up next is the CMC3 slot and even more token generators with Scoot Swarm and Chatterfang Squirrel General. Scoot Swarm is a 1-1 that, whenever a land ETPs under our control, creates a 1-1 insect token, or, if we have 6 plus lands in play, creates a token copy of itself instead. Initially getting us a few extra bodies on board, but, thanks to our large amount of land ramp, quickly turning into an exponentially multiplying threat as we keep making our land drops and ramping to completely take over games. Chatterfang is a 3-3 with Forest Walk that, when we would create one or more tokens, instead creates those tokens plus that many 1-1 Squirrel tokens, and also lets us pay a black and sack X Squirrels to give target creature plus X minus X until end of turn, effectively doubling up on our token production so long as he sticks around while weaponizing the tokens he creates by turning them into either removal or an offensive power-up for our commander. Morbid Opportunist then closes out this slot, being a 1-3 that, whenever a creature dies, draws us a card limited to once each turn, allowing us to get some extra card advantage as both our opponents and our creatures die off. Now entering the CMC4 slot, we're back on the token creation plan with Arasta the Endless Web, Creekwood Liege, and Shittering Witch. Arasta is a 3-5 with reach that, whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery, creates a 1-2 spider with reach, providing us with a solid defensive body that will produce even more bodies as our opponents fling their spells. Creekwood Liege is a 2-2 that gives all other black creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 and all other green creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 as well, in addition to creating a 1-1 black and green worm token on our upkeep, giving us a free body each turn as well as powering up most of our board by at least plus 1 plus 1. Chittering Witch is a 2-2 that, when it ETBs, creates 1-1 rat tokens equal to the number of opponents we have, and lets us pay 1, a black and sack a creature to give target creature minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, providing us with a decent number of bodies when it comes down, and then letting us turn those bodies and others into non-destruction based removal to deal with otherwise problematic threats. Then we'll add in the death payoff Erebos Bleak Hearted, a 5-6 enchantment creature who's not a creature unless our devotion to black is 5+, plus, lets us pay 2 life whenever a creature we control dies to draw a card, and lets us pay 1 a black and sack a creature to give target creature minus 2 minus 1 until end of turn, making him a potent death payoff to replenish our hands as our creatures are destroyed or sacrificed, and even allowing us to turn those creatures into removal to proc himself. And finally, we close out this slot with Uvenvald Oddity, a 4-4 hasty trampler that lets us pay 5 and double green to transform it into Uvenvald Behemoth. A 7-7 hasty trampler that also gives all other creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 and trample, dropping in the mid-game as a serviceable body for the cost and later turning into an anthem and source of AoE trample to make our entire board even deadlier. The CMC5 slot then brings us its only two members with Ghoul Collar Gisa and Loyal Guardian. Ghoulcaller Gisa is a 3-4 that lets us pay a black, tap or and sack another creature to create X-2-2 zombie tokens, where X is equal to the sacked creature's power, giving us an instant speed way to sack our big creatures for extra board presence, or in response to removal to get use out of their big stat blocks one last time. Loyal Guardian is a 4-4 trampler that, at the beginning of combat on our turn, if we control our commander, gives all creatures we control a plus one plus one counter, passively pumping our wide board states turn after turn unless it or our commander are dealt with. The CMC6 slot is then up next, starting off with yet another pair of token generators, those being Wolverine Riders and Rampaging Baloths. Wolverine Riders are a 4-4 that, on each upkeep, create a 1-1 elf token and, whenever an elf ETBs under our control, gains us life equal to its toughness, gaining us 4 1-1s in life per rotation to keep both our creature count and life totals nice and high. 
Rampaging Bailoths are a 4-4 Trampler that, whenever a land ETBs under our control, creates a 4-4 Beast token. Turning all our land drops per turn and land-based ramp into additional mid-sized bodies to help grow our board state even further. Then we close out the CMC 6 slot with Thunderfoot Bailoth, a 5-5 Trampler that, if we control our commander, gains plus 2 plus 2 and gives all other creatures we control plus 2 plus 2 and trample, making it another AoE Anthem and Trample Source to power up our tokens to overwhelm our opponent's board states. Nearing the end now, the CMC 7 slot brings us its only entrant with Avenger of Zendikar, a 5-5 that, when it ETBs, creates 0-1 plant tokens equal to the number of lands we control, and, whenever a land ETBs under our control, puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each plant creature we control. Assembling an instant army of tokens as soon as it hits the board that may start off small but it can get big quick as we make our land drops or use our land based ramp. And finally, reaching the CMC 8 slot, we have our last creature entrant, Kamal Heart of Krosa. A 5 5 who, at the beginning of combat on our turn, gives all creatures we control plus 3 plus 3 and trample until end of turn, as well as letting us pay 1 in a green to turn a land we control into a 1 1 elemental with vigilance indestructible and haste that's still a land until end of turn. Capping off our creature base with another powerful anthem and source of trample that we can even pump our excess mana into to weaponize our lands if we need extra reach. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have its single entry with Village Rites, which has a sack of creature to draw to, making it a dirt cheap way to turn our excess tokens into card advantage, or get extra value out of creatures who would be destroyed anyway. In a similar vein, the CMC2 slot starts off with Deadly Dispute and Reckoner's Bargain, both of which let us sack a creature artifact to draw two, the former also creating a treasure, and the latter gaining us life equal to the sack permanent CMC, making them more expensive copies of Village Rites with some decent upside to make up for their increased cost. We'll also be running Plum the Forbidden, which draws us a card and loses us a life and allows us to sack one or more creatures, letting us copy it for each one sacrificed allowing us to easily call our creature base to reload our hands on the cheap. Some removal options then join us as we move deeper into this slot with Go for the Throat and Infernal Grasp, both of which destroy target creature, the former being limited to non-artifacts and the latter costing us two life to use, making them both solid and dependable sources of creature removal. Wilt is then added in as well, which destroys target artifact or enchantment and has cycling for two, giving us access to decent back or removal while giving us the option to cantrip it away if we'd rather have the draw instead. And finally, we close out this slot with Golgari Charm, which has us choose one of the following effects. Give all creatures minus one minus one until end of turn, destroy target enchantment, or regenerate each creature we control, making it a very flexible spell that can serve as either a mini wipe, decent removal, or board wipe protection depending on what the situation calls for. Now almost at the end of our instance, the CMC3 slot adds in another pair of removal spells to our arsenal with Beast Within and Corrosin Grip. Beast Within destroys target permanent and has its owner replace it with a 3-3 token, allowing us to deal with almost any type of permanent threat with relative ease and little downside. Cross and Grip destroys target artifact or enchantment and has split second, not only dealing with troublesome back row effectively, but also preventing our opponents from reacting to it to stop combos dead in their tracks. And finally, reaching the CMC4 slot, we have our last instance with Death Sprout, which destroys target creature and puts a basic land from our deck into play tapped allowing us to deal with problematic creatures and ramping us while doing so. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we have some ramps starting us off with Rampant Growth, Far Seek, and Nature's Lore, all of which put a land from our deck into play, the first being limited to basics and putting it into play tapped, the second being limited to non-forests with a basic land type and also putting it into play tapped, and the last fetching up any forest all being superb ways to speed up and fix our mana base cheaply and efficiently. Even more ramp then joins us in the CMC3 slot with Cultivate and Kodama's Reach, both of which search our deck for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other into our hand. Again, speeding up our mana base and ensuring we can make our land drop per turn as well. Primal Growth then closes out this slot, which searches our deck for a basic land and puts it into play and can be kicked by sacking a creature to put two lands into play instead, giving us even more ramp that also works with our sacrifice-oriented deck to proc our payoffs as well. Then skipping all the way to the CMC7 slot, we move away from ramp and onto wipes with Necrotic Hex, which has each player sack six creatures, then creates six 2-2 zombie tokens for us that come into play tapped, making it a solid wipe that bypasses lots of relevant defenses and leaves us with a decent board state after the dust settles. And finally, reaching the CMC 8 slot in our last sorcery, we have Azuri's Predation, which creates a 4-4 beast token for each creature our opponents control and then has each fight a different creature, 
flooding the board with decent sized tokens and then clearing the board of small to mid sized threats while doing so, and possibly bigger if we have anthems in play to pump up those tokens. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, the first half brings us Fonta Fertility, which we can pay one, a green and sack, to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, adding in yet another cheap and reliable form of land based ramp to further beef up our mana base and proc our landfall token creation. Then we wrap up the CMC1 slot with Vampiric Rites, which lets us pay one, a black and sack a creature to draw a card and gain a life, providing us with a low cost back row source of card advantage that lets us turn our spare tokens into cards repeatedly and cheaply at instant speed. Skipping to the CMC3 slot, we then have some additional token generation sources with Awakening Zone, Curse of Restless Dead, and Cloakwood Hermit. Awakening Zone, on our upkeep, creates a 0-1 Eldrazi spawn token that we can sack to generate a colorless mana, giving us a steady stream of bodies we can sack to ramp ourselves while proccing our Death Matters payoffs in the process. Curse of Restless Dead is an aura curse that, whenever the enchanted player has a land ETB under their control, creates a 2-2 zombie with Decayed for us, allowing us to build up our board as our opponents make their land drops or even as we do so if we enchant ourselves with it, further weaponizing our impressive land ramp package. Cloakwood Hermit is a background that, so long as we control our commander, creates two tapped 1-1 squirrel tokens on our end step if a creature was put into our graveyard from anywhere that turn. Effectively replacing the first token, we lose our sack each turn with two 1-1 bodies so long as our commander is able to stick around. And then closing out this slot, we have Beastmaster's Ascension, which, whenever a creature we control attacks, gains a quest counter, and, once it has 7 plus quest counters on it, gives all our creatures plus 5 plus 5, providing our entire board with an enormous stat increase that we can bring online the turn it comes down so long as we're able to swing in with at least 7 creatures for a devastating alpha strike. Moving on to the CMC4 slot, we have some additional token creation starting us off with From Beyond, which, on our upkeep, creates a 1-1 Eldrazi Scion we can sack to generate a colorless mana, in addition to letting us pay one, a green and sack it to search our deck for an Eldrazi and put it into our hand, making it an upgraded version of Awakening Zone that produces bigger tokens that can be used as a tutor if we were to add an Eldrazi or two to the build. Then, at the halfway mark of this slot, we have Binding of the Old Gods, a saga whose first chapter destroys target non-land permanents and opponent controls, its second chapter putting a forest from our deck into play tapped, and its last chapter granting all our creatures death touch until the end of the turn, serving as decent removal and ramp initially, and then closing on a board-wide death touch to turn even our most humble tokens into kill spells as they swing in for damage. Then closing out this slot, we have Death Reap Ritual, which, on each end step if a creature died that turn, draws us a card, providing us with yet another Death Matters payoff that grants us card advantage as both our opponents and our creatures die off from the relative safety of our back row. Then reaching the CMC5 slot, we have some more token generation starting us off with Paradox Zone and Verdant Embrace. Paradox Zone ETBs with a growth counter on it and, on our end step, doubles the amount of growth counters on it and then creates a 0-0 fractal token with X plus 1 plus 1 counters, where X is equal to the number of growth counters it has, pumping out exponentially bigger and bigger tokens each turn to completely take over games if it sticks around for long enough. Verdant Embrace is an aura that enchants a creature, giving it plus 3 plus 3 and creating a 1-1 Sapperling token on each upkeep, providing Wilson with a substantial stat boost and a steady stream of bodies to grow his congregation with. Moldervine Reclamation then joins us at the halfway mark, which simply draws us a card and gains us a life whenever a creature we control dies, getting us extra cards as our creatures are destroyed or sacked away for value, or reloading our hands entirely if our boards are wiped to help rebuild after the dust settles. And finally, reaching the end of this slot in our enchantments, we have Glorious Sunrise and Unnatural Growth. Glorious Sunrise, at the beginning of combat on our turn, lets us choose one of the following effects. Creatures we control gain plus one plus one and trample until end of turn, target land taps for triple green until end of turn, draw a card if we control a three plus power creature, or gain three life. Its anthem being the most useful to us to pump our tokens and allowing them to crash through blockers, but its ramp, draw and even life gain being nice options to have in our back pocket just in case as well. Unnatural Growth, at the beginning of each combat, doubles the power and toughness of each creature we control until end of turn, quite literally doubling our creature's effectiveness in combat on both offense and defense, and only getting better when combined with other anthems to make them even more powerful. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. The CMC1 slot brings us our only artifact entry, that being Wayfarer's Bobble, which we can pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped adding another cheap land ramp source to our deck's already impressive selection to keep our mana base nice and consistent. That covers our artifact, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. 
Beginning in the CMC3 slot, we have Nissa Voice of Zendikar, who comes into play with three loyalty and has the following abilities. Her plus one creates a zero one plant token, her minus two puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature we control, and her minus seven gains us X life and draws us X cards where X is the number of lands we control. Giving us a walker who's able to initially deploy tokens and later pump our entire board, both of which fit nicely into our game plan, and whose ult is a decent way to reload our hands if we're able to reach it. Moving on to the CMC4 slot, we have Garrick Unleashed, who comes into play with 4 loyalty and has the following abilities. His plus 1 gives target creature plus 3 plus 3 and trample until end of turn. His minus 2 creates a 3-3 beast token and, if an opponent has more creatures in play than us, gains a loyalty counter. And his minus 7 creates an emblem that, on our end step, searches our deck for any creature and then puts it into play. His plus one working nicely alongside our commander to pump up his damage, while his token creation and ult are powerful tools to build up our board states even further. The CMC5 slot then brings us another Garrick in the form of Garrick Primal Hunter, who comes into play with three loyalty and has the following abilities. His plus one creates a 3-3 beast token, his minus three draws us cards equal to the greatest power among creatures we control, and his minus six creates a 6-6 worm token for each land we control. His token creation working nicely to keep growing our board state and his draw effect synergizing well with our commander and background to reload our hands reliably. And finally, the CMC6 slot brings us our last walker entrant with Garrick Cursed Huntsman, who comes into play with 5 loyalty and has the following abilities. His plus zero creates two 2-2 two -two wolf tokens that, when they die, put a loyalty counter on each Garrick we control. His minus three destroys target creature and draws us a card, and his minus six creates an emblem that gives all creatures we control plus three plus three and trample. His token creation combining very well with our sack outlets and other Garricks to increase all their loyalty very quickly, allowing him to reach his ult in only a single turn to provide our entire board with a permanent and powerful anthem, while also having access to spot removal to deal with troublesome creatures as well. That covers all our planeswalkers, so let's move on to our land base. Starting off with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Lanawar Wastes, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we take a damage, Tainted Wood, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors if we control a swamp, Necroblossom Snarl, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal a swamp or forest and taps for either of our colors, Temple of Malady, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and scries one when it ETBs, Woodland Chasm, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and is considered a swamp and a forest. Blighted Woodland and Myriad Landscape, both of which tap for a colorless and we can tap and sack them to put two basic lands from our deck into play tapped. The former costing three and a green to do this, while the latter only costs two but comes into play tapped and is limited to two of the same basic land. And finally Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap and sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped. Then for our utility lands, we have Orin Reef the Vast Wood, Grim Backwoods, and High Market. Orin Reef the Vast Wood comes into play tapped, taps for a green, and also lets us tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on each green creature that ETB that turn, growing the vast majority of our tokens and our commander on the turn they come down for minimal commitment. Grim Backwoods and High Market both tap for a colorless and let us sack a creature for an effect, the former letting us pay two, a black, a green, and tap it to draw a card, and the latter letting us tap it to gain a life instead both giving us access to sack outlets from our land slots to get even more value out of our spare tokens and proc our death matters payoffs. And finally, we're running 10 swamps and 13 forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 24 creatures including the commander, 11 instants, 8 sorceries, 16 enchantments including the background, 1 artifact, 4 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 26 sources of tokens, 12 anthems and AoE sources of plus one plus one counters, 13 sack effects, and 5 death matters payoffs, leaving us with a substantial amount of token generation to both feed our background to keep it online and build up our board, plenty of ways to pump up our tokens and our commander or sack them away for value, alongside a handful of payoffs to get even more value out of them as they die off. For general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 14 card draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp and draw being on the higher end to ensure we have plenty of mana and resources to outpace our opponents, while our removal and wipes stay within normal ratios. Looking at our mana curve, we have 9 1 drops, 15 2 drops, 14 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 8 5 drops, 4 6 drops, 2 7 drops, and 2 8 drops giving us a mid-weight curve that aims to get our token generation out quickly to begin flooding our board with bodies, 
followed by our commander and background combo once we have the bodies to keep it online, and finally topping off with board wide pump in the form of anthems and plus one plus one counters to overrun our opponents. Currently, this deck is valued at 6486, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Zendikar's Royal and Spore Mound can be added in if we want more landfall sources of token creation. Scepter of Celebration works very nicely alongside our commander to create a decent number of tokens every time he swings in. Dreadhorde Invasion, Jadargul Collar of Nephalia, and Ophiomancer are useful for providing expendable tokens to sack for effects or our background. And Blossoming Bog Beast is another AoE pump effect with Trample attached that can help power up our board as we swing in. For upgrades, Tevish Zot Doom of Fools is a decent walker that provides us with both tokens and a way to sack creatures for value. Belladros Witherbloom and Tender Shoot Dryad are both superb token generators that proc every turn to quickly flood our board with bodies. Eldrazi Monument provides a solid anthem, evasion, and protection for our entire board at the low cost of sacking a creature each turn to maintain it, which our build can do easily. And Crater Hoof Behemoth makes for a powerful finisher that will help our creatures run over our opponents once they've reached critical mass. And finally, if we're aiming to double up on our fun, Primal Vigor, Parallel Lives, and Doubling Season all double up on our token creation to help grow our board as quickly as they drain our wallets. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone who's been participating in the channel's 5k giveaway and helping the channel reach its 6k milestone. And if you haven't done so already, please check out the link in the description on how to enter to win a copy of the Dina Soul Steeper build featured on this channel, and unlock further upgrades for it by subscribing. Then moving on to the results of our latest poll, it looks like Tasha the Witch Queen was able to steal the top spot from the competition, so look forward to a spell theft focused build featuring her soon. Then regarding this week's poll, we'll be actually putting that on hold for now, as I'll be taking a two week break to get some much needed R&R starting next week. That means we'll be back on August 20th with a full Tasha build, and then move right into pre-con upgrades for the Dominaria United Commander decks on the following week, so look forward to those coming soon. And as always, before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck decks floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.